Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Sorry the stream started a little, about a half an hour later than I was planning, um, but my computer just isn't, ah, isn't liking me streaming again, so it's been really, really tricky to just make it work. <laughs> um, so it hasn't been picking my phone, so hello nice to see you jack hi dally <laughs> hi digger nice to see you so uh, the focus of today's stream is purely on atlas land ownership and castles infrastructure and leadership roles as it pertains to atlas so if you are joining us either now live or you are watching this video and um, post stream meaning we're not live streaming right now Oh, my chat's not loading, loading on the stream. Um, make sure you check out episode one if you do need some help with Atlas. Let me make... This should hopefully fix chat here because chat's not showing up on my screen. There we go. That should fix chat. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to do a slightly longer intro than normal um, like we did yesterday so that we can ensure people who are coming in and just loading the stream don't miss anything because I do realize there's an ad before anything starts. So welcome um to go over just the quick basics for things um i am making these atlas basic streams and videos with the expectation that you understand the basic gameplay of war dragons so again the basic gameplay we're talking about how to level your buildings how to make your base work how to get your dragons how to attack how to get five flames instead of four or three um things like that so the very basic foundations of war dragons are really really important for you to understand before you try to move into Atlas. So if you are not quite sure about a lot of things or you just need some reminders on basics, don't be afraid to ask people for help. And of course, check out wdgeeks.info and we, <laughs> we go over a lot of the basics. So we talk to you about how wars work, how flames work, how you can really make yourself better in that regards. So these episodes for Atlas Basics, while they are meant for a basic and a new player to Atlas, they do have this expectation that you understand the basics of the game. So keep that in mind. So uh, Jack, yeah, I can show you real quick. So feel free to answer, ask questions in chat, guys. There will be times where I'll acknowledge that you have a question, but I may ask to wait to answer that question in the live stream, just so I can make sure I put it into the flow. But for Jack, I will show you where we buy Atlas Elite. So main screen of course main game this is where you do all main game stuff the atlas icon is the scroll with the stab and dagger uh right below my resources and above war so let's go there if you are a new player right now you do have a free week of atlas elite atlas elite currently is more expensive than normally it's five dollars a week um and we can talk about in episode three uh best practices for atlas um as you get into things so you just go to the store in atlas and then if you go to that's a normal elite. This should be in, there we go. So if you see right there, it says Atlas Elite Pack. Uh, you get a thousand diamonds um, and it costs $5. So there you go. Hi, DeBomb. Nice to see you. Hi, Helmraptor. Oh, hi, Orange Cherry. Well, I'm glad you just finished episode one. I'll make sure I put that on YouTube as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have mimosas today, but I did have like five shots of espresso. So we'll get at least a slightly pumped red. If I have any point I speak too quickly, please let me know. <laughs> All right, so that's where you buy Atlas Elite there, Jack. Oh, Kidoki. So we are in Atlas. We did go over all the basics um, yesterday about movement, summoning Primarchs, things like that. We will go into best practices, such as with attacking, with using the different Primarchs, things like that. That is episode three. Today, our pure focus is on getting land, holding land, how to use the infrastructure there, and then what your leadership team does and how you can use the rest of your active members that do not have a leadership role, such as officers or leaders, and how you can use them to make your Atlas experience more immersive and things like that. So can you just buy one week of Atlas Elite? Yep, right now all you can buy is one week at a time. They do not have any bulk purchasing options. So let's talk about owning land. We talked about briefly, there are different levels of land here. The handshakes, of course, is neutral zone. And then all of the gray ones and then the gold star are different levels of land. If at any point you forget which of these are, if you take a look at the guides on the forms, which that link should be posted in chat every once in a while by my nightbot, this is under guides and resources in, uh, in the forums, under Atlas, of course. This is beginner slash basic posters for line chats. Um, I have a lot of information here. It is sorted by what it's useful for. So if we look at the land here, neutral zone cannot be owned 
by any team. Same with No Man's Land. If you're looking for a different place to find this that is less postery and more normal, if we go to wdgeeks.info, which is where we are here, you can go to locations and infrastructure, which covers, you guessed it, locations and infrastructure. So uh, this has the full information. This is more information than anywhere else on locations and infrastructure. It's all here. You can click any of the infrastructure, go there. But let's say you want to learn about the regions. It has the symbol here. Click that. It'll take you right here. So this goes through. These are the different lands available. So regions come in levels one to five and are labeled using the symbol shown to the right, which are these giant symbols here. Some regions can be claimed, which is level two through five, and some cannot, which is the level one or the neutral zone. Um, um, the other land that cannot be claimed is no man's land. We will go over that. So for a beginner team coming out, Claiming land is got, is obtained or done in one of two ways. You can either claim brand new land, which will be coming out at the end of this month, or you can conquer it from another team. As you may expect, getting brand new land is much, much easier than trying to conquer from another team. Brand new land, you don't have to kill anyone else's troop just to take it, but you may have to kill other people off who also are looking for the same spot. Remembering that Atlas is a global game, so you do have platinum and some gold through Diamond 1 players, it is important that you remember that even though you may be a very strong platinum team, in the grand scheme of things, you have to consider your strength versus diamond teams. So that means level 5, the most desirable land, if you're a platinum team, stay the hell away. I'm not trying to discredit your team or say you guys aren't awesome in any way, but you have to remember that level five and level four teams are very, very, very competitive and for these top teams globally. So it is really important that you remember land is done globally. So let's going back to the game here. You can see again, we have all these different lands. If you are a platinum team, I highly suggest you go for a level to land. Level two is obviously the least desirable land, but all land comes with fantastic bonuses. And I want to show you a little bit about why you want those bonuses, and then I'll talk about how you get more of them. So land, there's many different elements, just as many elements as there are dragons, five, by the way, there are that many elements with land. Right now in the map that is currently open, which means those lands are currently claimed, the lands do follow a very specific color pattern to element, which is shown right here on War Dragons Geeks, or if I go to my posters, and I also have a poster for this if you want to post it in your line chat so you guys can remember that. So fire looks like, I, it looks like burnt lava to me. So, or um, dry, cooled lava. So lava comes out of the volcano and it turns like black and ashy. That's what fire zones look like. Ice looks like ice. Um, wind kind of looks like a swamp type area. Dark looks like if you think of the desert. Um, no man's land is red. And then earth looks like a little forest slash plains slash flowing waves of grain type. Now, it is not no, it should be noted that the new lands that are coming out, the elements that are there does not currently match the way it looks. So, notice that it is an issue. We'll get to that. So, your team needs to pick a level 2 land and an element that maybe you want. But red, why does the element matter? To be honest, for you guys, it doesn't really matter that much. But I would pick the element that your team most wants. For a lot of you, that's going to be dark because of season dragons and things like that. Um, Earth is a good one. Ice, they're all great uh, for specific dragons. So picking a land and why you want to do it. If you notice all the way over on the left hand side of my screen, you see a chest that's shaking with an exclamation point. That is my daily tribute. Just like you get daily egg tokens in your team meeting hall and main game, you also get a daily tribute if you own land in Atlas. I will say that again, if you own land. If your team is currently just a neutral land, which is fine, especially for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to get land yet, you don't get a daily tribute in Atlas. It's not a show up and you get free stuff thing. You actually do have to do something to work hard and own something to hold on to it in order to earn a daily tribute. So you guys are gonna get a first hand look to see what my daily tribute is. So I'm gonna click that, um, it's that way, that little rotating and shaking chest there. And this is gonna pop up with my daily tribute. Now, I want you to look at this and I want you to realize something very, very, very important. I am on a D2 team. We are a high achieving Atlas team, especially. So we do own quite a bit of land. I believe we're at 13 castles right now um, and some higher level land. So 
Um, when you own land, you will always get the opportunity to have breeding tokens, but only some of the higher level lands will give you the opportunity to get troops or to get clocks. So when I get to this daily tribute section, I have to select one of these. That's why it says choose one reward to claim. You don't get all of them, even if you have a bunch of castles. So I always choose egg tokens. So it says I have 13 castles in a region with token merchants. So some high level land has some troops. So oh, it looks like all my land has troop merchants but only three of my castles have time emergence. So I'm gonna select the tokens because I like the tokens. Collect, and there we go. Now, if at any point you wanna see what bonuses you get, this is where we come from. So infrastructure is what you build on a castle and infrastructure gives bonuses. So I want you to take in this screen for a second. I want you to notice there are five squares. In each of the five squares, there is an image of a building. All of these buildings are the different representations of infrastructure in Atlas. To pause for a second, in main game, when you build a building on your base, it just belongs to you. In Atlas, when you build something, it belongs to your whole team. Atlas is 100% a team run ability. So if you help build a castle or help build a headquarters or something for your team in Atlas and you leave that team, you don't take any of that with you. Everything that you build in Atlas stays with your team in Atlas always. Doesn't matter if you're the leader or the lowest level member. Whatever you help build in Atlas goes towards the team and the whole team either benefits or suffers. So it's a choice that you guys have to make as a team. Now, if your team has decided you don't want to be competitive in Atlas or you're not ready to be like to get there yet, that's okay. There's still a lot of benefits you can get from Atlas, which is what I covered in episode one, such as the XP base, just building troops in general, some of the basic things such as events. You're gonna see my cat walk across the screen in a second. So these benefits that you see appear, there are five pieces of infrastructure and these are those five pieces and what benefits they give me. So. Silver 2 HQ, the headquarters, gives me an additional um, bonus percent of XP every time I hit a gold mine. So if I hit a gold mine on my team Ruleth, I get an additional 31.9% XP added every time I hit a gold mine. That means it's way better and way more beneficial for me to hit a gold mine for all my multipliers than any XP base in normal game. That is really, really, really important. Once your team does own a castle, <laughs> you guys wanna say hi to Tofu? Is he okay? I'm a cat. Now he's purring. I'll sit here and pat him for a minute. So every time you guys build a headquarters, which is one of the infrastructure, you get bonus XP from gold mines. So gold mines and hitting a gold mine over a poacher is much better for your multipliers. Below that in green, you see silver to bank. So when I level up a bank, I get an additional um, percentage of gold every time I hit a gold mine. So um, that means I get an additional 45.6% more gold every single hit because we have higher level banks. In the very center there you see is the refinery. The refinery boosts how many um, elemental shards or dragon rider shards you get from hitting poachers in different areas. So if you see here, you can see the highest percentages are dark and wind. That means when my team hits a uh, poacher in a wind area or a dark area, no matter where it is, as long as it's dark or wind, we get an additional 419% more materials in those areas. The tower, which is the gold one on the top right, um, well, gold, pukey green, that makes my troops train a little bit faster, so at 15.4%. And then in the blue in the bottom, the fort, that is what's increasing my daily tribute. It is also really big to note that the biggest square here is refinery, but that is the very last thing your team should be upgrading. Cost-wise and holding your, um, your infrastructure, holding your castle and doing well, fort is the most important thing. So let's go over the more details. Look how happy he is. He's just so pleased. Tofu is a small being, most protected all costs. Right? Isn't he just like the cutest little kitty? He just is so snuggling. Hi. He's purring like a crazy person. So um, there is a lot to know about infrastructure. It's a big thing, but it's not that scary once you take a look. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to some of Rula's castles. Let's go to, well, we're already here. Ruleth the Chill. This is one of our level three castles. This is in ice. I remember that if a, green, a ring is green, that means you are welcome there. If a ring is red, that means you are not. If you see a ring that is red, should you go there? No! <laughs> Don't go to things that are red. 
So let's take a look, look at Ruleth the Chill. Remember that everything you're seeing is from the leader perspective in Atlas. All leaders and officers have the same screen when looking at infrastructure, and members have a slightly different look when looking at infrastructure. So I'm gonna click the castle there, and I'll push manage. So again, move would send my active Primarch there, set home would make that my home castle for Primarch and troop training, and then manage is what I want to do to see what's in the castle. All right, let's talk about what we see here. On the very far left, we see Primarchs. Here you can see all the Primarchs and the total troops that are here by team. So if there are multiple teams trying to ha attack me or do anything like that, all of those will show here under Primarchs. This in also includes troop gu or castle guards. But Red, what are castle guards? We'll get to that when we get to Fort. The next one here is Headquarters. And if you remember, Headquarters is what's going to give me the bonus XP from gold mines. I'm gonna click Headquarters here. This is what this looks like. Okay. Remember, this is from the leader perspective and most people will not see this. All right, before we talk into this, I wanna show you a kind of a cheat sheet for you. If I go down here, I have some posters for you for infrastructure at a glance to remind you what each thing does. And then I have a poster here for every piece of infrastructure. So let's go to the headquarters poster. Did I pass it? Is it up there? Tower, oh, there it is click. Hi, Shaw. All right. So here's my headquarters poster. You can see a picture of what the headquarters looks like. And in the black box, you see its bonus. So increases XP earned from gold mines. The member role is a governor. When I say member role, this is something that, uh, this is a role that you can appoint any member on your team to do. They can be an officer or they can be a normal member. I have to be, say something very, very, very swiftly and very clearly and very, <laughs> something that's just really important, okay? Don't just appoint a member of the role unless you're 100% sure what it does and they are 100% sure what it does. Appointing a member to a role prematurely can harm your team in the long run. So the member role here is governor. That means the member role, that person can control that piece of infrastructure just as if they were the officer or the leader. I'm going to say that again. Member roles can influence and control that piece of infrastructure as if they are a leader. They have the same exact uh, permissions that I do or that your officers do. It is very important that you do not assign a member a member role and thus you are 100% sure they know what they're doing, you know what it does, and you trust them. Uh, at first, Ruleth did not have any member roles. We are very slow to roll this out, and it's very important that you do so very carefully because pressing the wrong button could cost your team millions in infrastructure costs, okay? So member role on these little pieces of paper here are who can control, who can control that piece of infrastructure as if they had a leader position, okay? <laughs> The importance on this sheet, can you guys see this poster? Oops, I hope you can. The importance on this sheet is, it, is it something that should be built first or left to last? Basically is that. Headquarters is something that you'll need to build right away just because your headquarters has to be a certain level for your other infrastructure pieces to level up. What are the actions that are done at the headquarters here? So you can pay the upkeep, rename the castle, or set up infrastructure from storage. Now, this little two paragraphs below go more into depth about what those actions are, what the bonuses are, how the bonuses go, things like that. If you want to see the very specific math, go to wdgeeks.info and check out the infrastructure and locations there. It is much more in-depth math-wise. So, the action of pay upkeep. You got to pay bills for your castle. If you don't pay your bills, they turn the lights off. If they turn the lights off, that means you cannot use any piece of that castle infrastructure until you pay your bills. It is like you don't pay your electricity bill, they shut off the lights until you pay your electricity bill. The reason why that is bad in Atlas is if your upkeep lapses, if you do not pay your bill, you do not pay upkeep, they take away your castle and you have to get it and earn it back. And while your castle has been taken away from you, somebody else could come take it from you instead. It is very important to note that. The section, second action that you can do in the headquarters is rename your castle. 
Renaming your castle is not free. It does cost gold to do, but the longer you own your castle, the cheaper it is to rename it. The other action you can do here is set up infrastructure from storage. So if you have a castle, you lost it, somebody took it from you, all the infrastructure that you built at that castle goes into storage. It doesn't, it's not given to the team that conquers the castle, it just goes into storage. So you can set it from storage. Let's talk about those actions as it actually pertains in main game. So let's talk about the first action, which is upkeep. If you look at the very top up here, you see a grayed out button that says too soon to pay. And it tells you how much it costs. To pay the infrastructure here at um, Ruleth the Chill, it costs 3.8 million gold to keep the lights on here. Now you can see a little bit to the left of that, it says upkeep due in nine days, 14 hours and 26 minutes. If we click the little eye next to upkeep due, it gives you just a definition of what's going on. Infrastructure costs gold to operate. The upkeep cost is due periodically. If it is not paid, infrastructure will cease to operate and it'll be like infrastructure didn't even exist. If upkeep is paid late, the infrastructure will have to restart operations and this takes some time. It takes three days. Upkeep cost depends on the level of your castle. This means the higher level your castle and the higher level your HQ, I think. No, just the higher level your castle, I think like land wise, um, it costs more. So level three, ours costs 3.8 million and it is costs or it has to be paid every 10 days. Now, ready for my tip of the day. <laughs> if we look back here, it says the upkeep is due in nine days, but I can't pay it yet. It's too soon to pay. If that button is not grayed out, but the upkeep isn't due today, pay it. Just pay it. As soon as that button is green, which uh, it turns green at five days until due date, just pay your infrastructure then. Those five days get added into your next rotation. So let's say I pay this infrastructure here when it's due in five days. That means as soon as I pay it, the next infrastructure um, upkeep, it will be due in 15 days. So that five days does get added on. So you get to keep that. So it's very, very, very important to pay your upkeep early. Your team will get a message, your whole team and system messages, when you are 24 hours remaining until upkeep is due. Do not wait that long. If you wait that long, your team might freak out. And there is no reason to wait that long. What Foresight does, um, Foresight Science is an officer on my team who is in charge of, she's our gold launderer. <laughs> So she manages our gold. She decides where it gets to go, all of that. And she manages all of this. And what she managed to do is make her upkeeps all due at relatively similar times. And I think she just has like an alarm set. And so she just pays it all at once. Um, so if you can manage to pay your infrastructure for specific times to get them closer to do at the same time, it does cost more gold at once that way, but you're less likely to forget. So. Infrastructure can be paid. Let's take a look at the second action. Oops, the second action again. So pay upkeep. We talked about how you do that. The second action is rename castle. So rename castle is something that can only be done by someone in leadership or of course someone that is, um, what do you wanna call it? Governor. So the person that is in the member role. So if you get the member role, you can say rename castle. If I press that button, say your team governor can rename that castle now. Guess who's the only person that could rename that castle now, guys? Forsy. Not kidding. So when I said go through member roles and be very, very, very careful who you appoint, this is one of the reasons why. That single member, that non-officer member even, if you choose to make it a non-officer, will get to rename your castle, which costs gold. You hear me? You hear me? Good. All right, the second thing that you can do, of course, is set up infrastructure from storage. So how do we do that, Red? Well, if I go down here, see where it says the big green button that's right above my hand, right here? Where it says uh, set up infrastructure from storage? Guess what? That's where you set up infrastructure from storage. <laughs> you can also view your storage here. Um, and you can see the infrastructure we have in storage. It tells you what level it is. And this is just one set. So if we were to have a second set of infrastructure in storage, it would be in another set of gold boxes right below this one. You only get infrastructure in storage if your team has owned a castle that had infrastructure and then that castle was lost. Okay. So this is headquarters. Uh, post questions in chat if you guys have questions. I'm just gonna go over the basics again real quick of HQ. The active role in headquarters is the governor. The governor can do everything and sometimes things that the leaders cannot do. You have to pay your bills, which is upkeep, in order to make your infrastructure the 
whole castle keep working. As you level up your, uh, your headquarters, your bonus does increase. Your bonus is on the top left-hand side of your screen there, which is your XP gained from gold mines, which makes it much easier to level up dragons. Um, you can upgrade, of course, by paying gold, which is over on the left. It tells you how much gold it will cost. Um, and then it will also tell you how long, how many days it'll take, which is 20.9 in this case. You can rename your castle only if you are your castle's governor. You can view your storage and set up infrastructure from storage only if you have infrastructure and storage. You do not start with infrastructure and storage, kiddos. You have to build a castle and then lose it in order to have a set of infrastructure in storage. This is the headquarters. The last note about headquarters I'm going to say is this. The governor controls the whole castle, not just headquarters. The governor controls the whole castle. Every other piece of infrastructure on that castle, the governor controls. So this is the headquarters. Questions? I don't see any questions in chat. I think I gave you guys enough time to ask them. Um, headquarters, pretty simple with me. I really like the infrastructure in Atlas. Don't be afraid to poke around in it because the simple fact is you're probably not gonna break anything. Just try not to push a lot of buttons. <laughs> um, but look, read, um, the infrastructure layout is actually really simple because you can see everything that's going on. All right, let's look at our next piece of infrastructure, which is the one that you guys will love the most, which is the bank. All right, let's look at our bank picture here. The bank. So the bonus that you get from bank is in black here, of course, in the poster, which is increases gold from gold mines. Guess what it happens when you increase your bank? It increases the gold you get from gold mines. Complicated, right? Okay. The member role here is the banker. The importance is primary. This is one of the main infrastructure pieces you want to level up. The two actions are set taxes and distribute resources. Um, there's a lot of information down there. The bank is probably one of the roles that you want to fill the quickest, but I would highly recommend that you set some very strict rules for this. So let's take a look at the bank here for Ruleth the Chill. Oh, we have a lot of shit in this bank. <laughs> All right, so if we read the screen, we can go through the things pretty quickly. On the upper left-hand side, the banker, you can see our banker at this um, one is Sal. Hi, Sal. I lovely Ozzy on the team. So one thing that I have found um, for the bankers is this. I love having bankers that are a time zone that is opposite from a majority of my officers. So uh, my officers, I am Eastern US time, um, Psy and Psy is an hour behind me. I think Mech is two hours behind me. Jade is five hours ahead of me. And Wolf, I believe is the same time zone as me. So we are all in a very set section of our time zones, but Sal is the complete opposite time zone. That is really useful when it comes to your team requesting resources, because if I'm not there, Sal is most likely going to be. She is not only one of my most active members, but she's a member that I really, really, really trust. And the reason why I want to say that I trust her a lot is she can control where all of these resources go. Yeah, which is scary <laughs> if you don't trust that person. So until you find someone that you are 100% sure you can trust, don't assign anyone. Now, the simple rule that we set up for our bankers and for our officers and for myself, the leader, is this. A banker leader officer you cannot send resources to yourself. So if I have a resource request in for 1.5 million gold so I can upgrade a dragon, I can't send it to myself. I have to ask an officer or Sal or whoever else may be a banker, depending, to send me those resources instead. This is a checks and balances system to ensure that nobody is abusing their position. Cool? All right, so that is the banker. Of course, on the left-hand side underneath banker, you can see it is level six, how much it'll cost to upgrade to the next level, etc. Um, at the very top, you can see the bonuses. If I click the eye next to bonuses, it'll tell me. Owning a territory and upgrading buildings grants bonuses to your entire team. The bonus listed here is the total bonus your team has earned across all of your territory and infrastructure. A castle only contributes bonuses when it is online, aka when you've paid your bills and the lights haven't turned off. <laughs> Hi, Griffin. <laughs> nice to see you, love. All right, so let's talk about these buttons here and what's going on. Um... 
So Mama Mayhem saying, do the rules change per castle or for all land infrastructure owned? It is per castle. So Sal is the banker at the castles that I specifically assign her to. So all um, roles are assigned per castle. That is a great question. Um, officers, and, officers and the leader can control everything. And then the individual people can be assigned per castle. What we did, um, because we have a lot of land, is it's okay to have the same person assigned at multiple places. So for instance, Sal is actually the banker at our entire ice region. So if I exit out of this, so see this little ice territory? Sal controls all of all of those banks. So what we've done is we've assigned um, by region because we have quite a few castles. This is so she can kind of manipulate and use resources in a, in a easy way because she knows what she can draw on. It's not overwhelming. It's in a very set specific place in um, the world. So if we go to a different castle, it has a different governor, it has a different banker, things like that. All right. So going back into the bank here, let's talk about the buttons. The first one is the one that all of you will want to know about the most, which is set tax. This button is terrifying. In order to upgrade your infrastructure, you need gold. That's very obvious if you look over there on the left where it says level six, how much gold it costs to upgrade. To upgrade your infrastructure, the gold has to be in the bank. So if you look right up there, <laughs> you'll see that we have food in there. We have 22 million gold in there. We have wood in there, etc. The gold has to be sent to this bank to be upgrade any infrastructure on this specific castle. When you first conquer a castle, you get it for the very first time, everything will be level zero, but there is still a bank. So you can still send resources to this bank. You just can't take anything back from it, but you'll have to send gold to this bank so you'll have enough gold to upgrade the bank and then use it. The more you upgrade the bank, of course, the bigger your storage gets, just like a normal storage hut. So in your storage hut in game, which is again, your personal storage hut, you level up, you get a higher capacity. And this, this is your whole team's bank. We all share the same exact ones. And as you level this up, it again increases capacity and increases how much gold and food and wood you can send away. So, hi Passing Wind, nice to see ya. So in order to obtain tax, or I'm sorry, in order to obtain gold for your team to level up your infrastructure, there's one of two things you can do. First one is your team can just send gold there. Ruleth has a rule of uh, minimum donations, meaning our team has to donate a certain amount of gold every month. Um, we've done it by week. You can do it however you like. We like it by month so players can really choose how they're using their gold because we have that freedom now because of how, many, how much gold our team typically donates. Have a minimum, say every week you guys need to donate, you know, 2 million gold or 3 million gold. For those of you who have Atlas Elite, will be really easy. For those of you who don't have Atlas Elite, I believe 3 million gold is like 340,000 gold a day, which is two runs, three runs. Have a minimum, start low. I would really recommend doing donations to get gold for your team infrastructure because it does not punish the most active. Red, what do you mean punish the most active? The second way you get gold is by taxing. <sighs> the tax basically does anytime somebody on your team hits a minor bank or hits a mine or a poacher, a percentage of that gold is taken from them and put into the bank. Tax is a little complicated. It's also much more difficult to control because the way people are taxed is by where their home is. So the only people that would be taxed by me changing Ruleth the Chill here are people who have set their home castle at Ruleth the Chill. So if you haven't caught on to what I mean by that, that means if one of your members sets their home to somewhere else, they evade the tax. Right, right. Well, you say, but my members wouldn't do that. Yeah, they would. Either out of malice or because some of them just don't realize. So the tax only taxes people who have their home set there. So that is another reason why Ruleth leaves their tax at zero always um, is because you can avoid it. And also this way it's not punishing the players who want to be more active. So if you have someone that runs 15, 16 times a day, you're taking more gold from them than the person who runs like one or twice. Wouldn't you rather have everyone be on equal footing and everyone on your team pull the same weight and not put the entire weight of your team on one person's shoulders? I know I sure as hell would. Hi V. That was one of my teammates that just followed. How you doing love? So this is the bank. This is tax. Um, one way you can tell how many people have your home set or have their home set as that castle is by looking at it. So if you look here, do you see those little um, like bumps, those little nodes around the castle there? Do you see those? They look like little huts or little like castles or dens. 
Only four of my teammates have their home set to Ruleth the Chill. You can see over here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight that have this set as home. And if we look over, is this igloo? And there are four over at Igloo that have their home there. So um, I would much, much, much rather have my entire team donate equally. And there is a pretty easy way that you can manage that. So if I go into bank, this is another button in bank. Right below set tax, you see view ledger. Ta-da! So view ledger, you can see how much gold people have sent. You can see exactly what time they sent it in your time zone. Um, bank credit and bank debit are credit is you sent gold there debit is you took or sent gold away so you can see sal our banker here um sent um some wood to sandor at 808 th or 908 this morning so this is one way we go red it's so hard to track that well guess what there's another tab here it says weekly summary da, 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 da. you can see how much gold and wood and whatnot my team has donated here as well as who's taken wood out which is my banker there um, you can see Nuffle and myself have transferred gold, Wolf has transferred gold, things like that this week. So this ledger is for the entirety of this week. So if you are going to track how much your team is sending, I would really make sure you look at the weekly summary. But this weekly summary does reset. For me, I'm in Eastern time, um, so Midwest US, same time zone as New York. Um, if you look in here, this um, <laughs> resets at 3 a.m. So what I do every day is I screenshot our bank, our weekly summary, and I load it into a sheet. So weekly summary is really, really great. If you do have multiple castles in the future, I recommend that. Well, I'll we'll talk about that later. Okay. So weekly summary in bank, you can see the ledger and you can see it transfer by transfer. So, and like Anonymous said, make sure you catch the ledgers before reset for sure. Hi, JJF. How's it going, buff? Next, I called you brother and love at the same time. So you're bruv. <laughs> okay. So let's view ledger. Oh my gosh. My hair is still wet for my shower. All right, so send resources to a teammate. This is something obviously only I have because I am leader and banker has two officers have as well. I can select any person on my team I wanna send resources to. So if I select, I'm gonna send stuff to, no one on my team is online here right now. Oh, you know, I forgot who you are. I don't remember, who. are you Iggy? <laughs> I forget, I won't ask. Um, So like if I go to, let's send it to, for side so she doesn't get mad i can either do the sliding bar here and send her wood uh, i can do golds i can do gold and wood or food i can do anything i want sliding bar and this will show you the maximum that you can take so i could send her technically one transfer 650 wood uh 2.8 million gold or 650 um food this way so that is iggy in chat i thought so but i don't like to assume so let's go find iggy iggy so we're, right now we're gonna send iggy some wood hi v so if I go here, I'm going to send Iggy 100 food. I can tap that box and type. I'm not going to send you any gold because of course I'll get mad at me. So I can do this. So you can say this. Um, again, transfer in 20 minutes. This is like a normal transfer. Confirm. And if we go into our team chat down here. <laughs> Hi, Angela. Hi, Pog. All right. So you can see right there that the resource has gone through. <laughs> Oh, my team is hilarious. You can see the resources have gone through here. Um, so it'll take 20 minutes to go from the storage hut um, of that bank to hit um, Iggy there. So 20 minutes, just like a normal transfer, but now it comes from the bank instead of from my storage, which is really, really, really neat. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> uh... <laughs> my team is so cute. I love you guys so much. All right, so that is the bank. Something to note, um, if you remember episode one yesterday, the colors of the Primarchs around the castle are important. Blue is your team, green is you, um, yellow is your alliance, and red, we all know in Atlas, red is bad. Red is scary, red is dangerous, stay away from red. So because there are no enemy Primarchs on this, the gold and the or the food and the wood will go through easily. If an enemy Primarch is sitting on my castle, It'll cancel this transfer and it won't actually go to Iggy, which is a problem, right? I know, terrifying. So that is another reason why we talked yesterday to keep your cats, your lovely, lovely members who don't pay attention, keep them away from red circles. Because if one of your cats goes and sits on one of their, somebody's castle, it'll actually block these transfers. They can't use their bank and things like that, which is a bad, 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 bad thing. Okay guys, terrible. So. Cool. let's go back in the bank here 
The bank is probably the piece of infrastructure you guys will use actively the most. So if you outgoing transfers, I can now look here and see that in 18.4 minutes, 100 food and 100 wood are going to land at Iggy's uh, storage hut there. So I also have two transfers left available. Just how each player has three transfers out at a time, each castle has three transfers out at a time. So if I were to send two more transfers from this bank, I could then go to a different bank and send more food and wood to Iggy. Um, the last one here is send resources to this bank. Everyone on your team will have this. Um, everyone will have send or uh, transfer resources from storage hut. Only leaders, officers, and bankers will be able to transfer from team bank. So if I go to transfer from storage hut, I don't have anything, but it'll let me exchange rubies for gold. So if I want to donate some of my ruby or some of my diamonds, I can send it for gold this way. Um, or I can do from team bank. So because I have access to every single bank, um, cause I'm the leader of my team, I can send resources from any bank to this bank. So I could go to like rule of the night, could transfer this and this would all go, it would take 20 minutes. Things again. Red is bad. <laughs> I know, right? Red is bad. Hi, nice to see you. Welcome to the stream, love. All right, do you guys have questions on the bank? So um, ask questions in chat if you have them on bank, if, even if it's a question that you know the answer to, but you think somebody else may not. I will go over the basics of the bank really quickly and we can get to it. So we go here, there's the bank. The person in the role that actively controls the bank is the banker. Please make sure you are very careful with who you promote to banker as they have full control over the bank, including tax and all of the resources there. Also remember that the governor of the castle controls every um, single piece of infrastructure. So the governor controls this and the banker. I would really recommend that everyone has a rule that says, oh, you cannot transfer resources to yourself, which would mean if I need food, I can ask Sal to send them to me. Or if Sal needs food, I can send them to Sal. But Sal cannot send to herself and I cannot send to herself. That is not a mechanic in the game. I would just highly recommend that as a rule so that way you don't have some people stealing gold from you basically or being biased things like that um the bank gives you the bonus of extra gold from gold mines you can see that in the upper left hand corner of your screen our bonus is 45.6 percent across the board the bonus that is shown on your banks is the total bonus that you get from all of your banks if you click the eye next to bonus it reminds you of this of course if you don't pay your bills your upkeep in the headquarters your bonus will disappear from that bank um, the bank can hold a certain amount of food, wood, and gold. The higher level your bank is, the more food, wood, and gold you can have. Your team can set a tax, but remember that tax will tax every single player who has that bank or that castle set as their home. If they set their home elsewhere, they will not be hit by that tax. Instead of taxing to get gold for your infrastructure, I highly recommend you do a donation system. Everyone can send resources to bank by pressing this button that's right behind my head, and you can check and see who sends gold, food, and wood by looking at the ledger or the weekly summary. The weekly summary my um, in Pacific Standard or Pacific Time from PG's clock is uh, at midnight between Saturday and Sunday. So I check at 11.59 PG time, um, which I believe is also when multipliers um, reset and when the daily tribute from main game comes out as well. Highly recommend you screenshot before this. I usually screenshot it an hour ahead of time and then check for any additional transfers. This way you'll be able to track and see who is and who is not donating to your team. Um, once we leave bank, uh, this is of course, we can send resources to a teammate if I'm a banker, leader, or officer, or the governor. I can view, only send three transfers at a time. I can view my outgoing transfers here. And I can send resources to this bank if I am a member, can send for my storage hut. If I am a banker, leader, or officer somewhere else, um, I can also send from other team banks. Any questions about the bank? Hi, Dally. <laughs> red is bad, not red. <laughs> I like the distinguish of the capital and the lowercase r, Dally, thank you. Hi, puppies. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's the bank. The next one we have is the most important piece of infrastructure, even though you're not going to actively use it very often other than to upgrade it. So let's go take a look at the fort poster over here at um, the forums. All right, the fort increases your daily tribute controls the shield and the blockade. The daily tribute is what I collected at the very start of the stream. So I clicked that I got my egg tokens from it. So when you level up your forts and get more forts, 
you will increase the amount of egg tokens or troops or whatever that you get at the start of every single day. It controls the shield, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and it controls the blockade. The blockade is the angry circle. So the circle around Rule of the Chill is obviously green because my team owns it, but it also makes sure the blockade is there. So if you own a castle but do not have a fort, you don't have an angry red ring. That angry red ring will lock someone there to block them in. It's a blockade. It keeps them at that castle so they can be killed. <laughs> it's also a pain. It controls the blockade. Make sense? Not only does it build the blockade, but it allows you to control who gets stuck in the blockade, which is super lovely. The active role here is the marshal. The importance of this piece of infrastructure is primary. This is one of the first things that you need to upgrade. And this is the first piece of infrastructure you need to put max for its level. The actions that can be done by the marshal or the governor, remember, the they can grant passage, meaning that blockade, they can make that angry red blockade turn green for someone. They control the shield, which again, we'll talk about in a moment, and assign castle guards. Super exciting. One of the reasons that the fort is so important is that blockade that allows people passage into your land. It increases the bonuses you get from Atlas, guys. This increases your bonuses. Level this up. But it also saves your team. Let me talk about this. Your fort gives you guys a bonus. Meaning if you're at home and somebody comes to attack you, it increases the stats of your Primarchs at home. Makes your Primarchs way stronger if you're defending your own home, which is great. So let's go back to the game. Let's click Fort and let's see what we're talking about. There's a lot going on here, okay? Annie's or um, Iggy says, so make sure you donate 25 minutes before re- <sighs> Iggy, you're an idiot. I actually, so to backtrack shortly, I set a screenshot um, an hour before reset in the banks every week. I actually then the next morning go back at the individual ledgers to see if anyone donated between 2 and 3 a.m. my time. Because I don't want to stay up till 3 a.m. <laughs> All right. There's a lot going on here. Let's talk about this. Remember that this is the basics only. So there is a little bit more in depth that you can do with your fort if you have level 4 and 5 lands. We're only going to cover the basics as it pertains to someone who is brand new to Atlas or is still learning the ropes and making things go. The marshal. You can see that there is no marshal here. It says none appointed as for science to appoint a marshal for this castle. The reason why it's asking for Sai is because she is the governor of this castle. She is the one that can make and um, appoint people to certain positions. Makes sense? Um, you can see this is level six. I could pay 27.4 million gold technically to upgrade it. Um, we'll talk more about why I say technically. Fort boost defending it. The fort boosts defending troops and allows management of free passage and shields. So right away, it tells you what the purpose of the fort. Now when it says fort boosts defending troops, there's a combat bonus. If you look at the bottom of the screen where it says fort combat bonus plus 120, let's click that I there. It'll actually click my fat fingers. Okay, this is the fort bonus. This is why it's really important to have this to own and keep a castle. When a team's Primarchs are attacked at their castle, their fire power is augmented, it is changed, by the fort. The fort will also protect Primarchs belonging to any team which has been granted safe passage by the marshal. That means your allies who automatically get safe passage to all of your castles. And any castle you give free passage, making that red ring turn green, any team that you do that gets your fort combat bonus. Sweet, right? So that means somebody who attacks your Primarch when it's at home loses more troops than yours than they would if they hit you like in no man's land or something like that so the fort makes it so your team is less likely to lose more troops it protects you it increases your bonuses things like that it's really really important to build a fort in order to protect your home your fort increases um your bonuses here it's super important all right all right along the top you can see the bonuses i get again it has an eye so feel free to click that eye owning a territory upgrading buildings grants bonuses to your entire team does that phrase sound familiar the bonus listed here is the total bonus your team has earned across all of your territory and infrastructure. Again, the whatever is listed on the infrastructure is your total bonus again. A castle will only contribute bonuses when it's online, aka when you pay your bills. So pay your fucking bills, bitches. <laughs> pay your upkeep. Um, hi, Angela. Nice to see you, love. Um, so you can see the bonuses that are available to my team. Um, so we have clocks, tokens, and troops. Now, let's talk about where it says higher guards. It's the top green button here. So this says defender base level 380 and we have 500,000 castle guards there. Now, the defender base. 
It's a level 380. That means when somebody is attacking my castle directly, not the Primarchs on it, so when they kill all my Primarchs, all our team's Primarchs that are there, if they're attacking the castle directly, they have to kill 500,000 of our um, castle guards, and they will not attack a player. They will attack a computer-generated base that is level 380. Does that make sense? Red, how do we get castle cards? For every piece of glory that your team earns, you get a castle guard. But Red, how am I supposed to know that? Well, looky here. I know I have a thing on this. Uh, there we go. Here's a poster. Castle guards. Castle guards are the last line of defense for owned castles. They are summoned to a castle's fort solely to defend against attacks. Once summoned at a castle, these are permanently attached to that castle and cannot be removed or transferred unless upkeep is not paid. Like, not paying your bills. <laughs> your team uh, earns one point of team glory for every point of personal glory you earn, like medals. So um, just how in main game, if you attack and earn a medal, it goes to your team medal count so you can declare wars. Same thing for castle guards and glory. So if you attack, you earn like 100,000 glory over the course of your whatever. Um, your team gets 100,000 100, castle guards. If you earn 750 glory, your team gets 750 castle guards. Does that make sense? So it's good for your team um, like that. But what I put at the note at the bottom of this poster, it says, be careful. I'll click this. At the bottom here, it says, be careful. Since castle guards cannot be moved without great risk. Meaning when you hire a castle guard, you can't just take it off because you made it boo-boo. We've had friends who've made boo-boos before, haven't we, Ruleth? So you can see I have 500,000 castle guards here, but look right above. Do you see that little glory symbol? It looks like a ribbon with a G in it or 5.6 million. Those are our available castle guards. So Sai might be mad at me for sharing that with the world, but we have 5.6 million castle guards we can put anywhere we want. And most of our castles have between half a million to 1.5 million guards on them already. Yay, Ruleth for being awesome. So um, how do we determine how many castle guards to put on a castle? That is what's coming next. So the shield. The shield is the bubble shield. A lot of you who are new to Atlas saw the bubble shield. It's purple and sparkly. The shield is triggered for uh, three reasons. One is if you lose too many troops. So in your fort, it says shield will be triggered if an additional 109,000 troops are destroyed. Those would be troops of the team who owns the castle. So if 109 troops of Rulith are destroyed on Primarchs at that castle, the bubble will pop. No, will come up. So one is by killing enough troops. Two is if there is a PvP event in main game. The main um, Atlas will never force you to do PvP main game and PvP in Atlas. It's always one or the other. So if you can attack people's castles in Atlas, there's no PvP in main game. But as soon as we have Kingdom Wars this week, the PvP bubbles will come up in Atlas so nobody can attack. So that's the second reason. The third reason is if there is a major update in Atlas. They do that so if some people are locked out of Atlas, like we all were when they added Platinum teams, everyone lost Atlas for a couple of hours. When it comes back up, they will put purple shields for a while or disable PvP so that way nobody has an unfair advantage and tries to conquer a castle when that team can't even go on to defend. So let's talk about shields. Oop, wrong screen. All right, so I do have a picture here for shields. Look at this. It's a lovely picture that talks about shields that you can share with your team or read here. This information is also on wdgeeks.info under infrastructure and locations. This is also under my beginner friendly guide part two, I think. So this beautiful sparkly bubble is called a Shield. <laughs> While the shield is up, no attacks can occur, occur between Primarchs on that castle. So if you see a purple sparkle shield, you are unable to attack at that castle. It makes it kind of like neutral land. Every PvP event main game causes Atlas shields to pop. I mentioned that. The castle can also be bubbled if the castle um, owners lose a certain number of troops at that castle. But here is the kicker here. But oh no! If a uh, castle is bubbled, it will last for 24 hours. You, it, it automatically stays for 24 hours before it drops. Once the bubble drops, another bubble cannot come up for three hours. The reason why that's so important is let's say your team's castle is bubbled. As soon as that bubble goes away, that shield goes away, three hours where your castle is 100% vulnerable. So you can see here, um, so rule of the chill, the shield will be bubbled, the shield will pop, whatever you want to call it. The bubble will go up if 109,000 troops are lost at this castle. So I can automatically disable the shield, but once the shield is disabled, either automatically, so the shield ran out after 24 hours, or if the far uh, marshal 
The castle governor or team leader officer presses disable shield whenever that happens. The shield is always down for three hours before it can come up again. So let's say one of our enemies comes and attacks Ruleth the Chill. They make her bubble pop. Once the bubble is down, no matter if I disable it or if it automatically goes away after 24 hours, they have three hours where we have to defend like hell because in those three hours, the shield will not come up again and they could take and conquer our castle. Does that make sense? So we'll talk about more in depth about attacking and things in episode three, but know that the shield is very specific and it can be very dangerous and it takes a lot of planning to keep your thing going. So <laughs> Red's voice is, for us is amazing. Oh, you're so sweet. Uh, Texas Rage triggers it, probably. <laughs> Iggy says, want us to go make a bubble for example purposes. No, don't bubble people unnecessarily. Goodness, you guys are terrible. All right, so we talked about hiring castle guards. Um, we talked about the shields. Now let's talk about passage. So passage is, my hair is such a mess today. This is so much fun. Passage, it makes that red bubble or that red circle angry ring of death red, or it makes it green. So your team grants passage on a global scale. So if I grant passage to a team, that means they always have that passage to every single one of my castles I own. You cannot grant passage just to one castle. You grant to all of them. So one reason why the marshal is so important is because of this as well. So not only can the marshal hire your guards, but you cannot get back. Not only can they disable your shield, leaving your team castle completely vulnerable, for three hours, but they can also grant passage to any team in the entire game that has Atlas. How fucking terrifying is that for someone that you do not entirely trust? So for the love of God, please don't just make high levels an officer just because they're high level. Don't make someone a marshal just because you want to stroke some egos. Be very, very careful with who you place as marshal. Atlas is a political game. If you grant the wrong team passage, another team may get pissed at you. Huh? Okay. So you can grant up to five teams. Um, you can look at your passage list, which I'm not going to show you who's passage for Ruleth, because uh, Atlas politics. Um, but I am gonna show you um, how you can grant passage. You go here, so let's say I wanted to type in um, Shah's alt team, so Shah happens. You can go here, confirm, and that'll go up, and now Shah happens is there. Make sense? So he's on our free passage list. I am actually gonna go to our passage list and delete Shah happens. I love you, but. There we go. So that is the fort. Does anyone have questions on the fort? Oh, shit. I was still on the same screen. Well, you saw who we had passage, so. Shh. Yes, text gets to grant passage at a time. Ah, double things. Okay. Any questions on the fort? Questions? Answers? Concerns? Fort is the most important piece of infrastructure. We good? All right. If you have questions, make sure you post them in chat there. I have too many screens going on right now. All right, the next fort we, or the next infrastructure piece we have is the tower. Hey, Red, can you post episode on YouTube, please? Team Music. Yeah, of course. It is on my Twitch channel under videos, but I will um, export it to YouTube after, right after we're done today, actually. Alliance colored rings. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's talk about Z Tower. All right, Miss Warren says, just to check, the higher the land, the higher level you can make a fort plus merchants. And you get more shards from poachers, right? Any extra benefits? Sure. So let's go to the levels here. So here we go. If you take a look, these are the infra levels. This is on my posters here. And no matter what level your land is, you can max headquarters, you can max your bank, and you can max your tower. So headquarters, you can get a huge bonus XP, bank you can get a lot more gold back, and tower, you can reduce your troop training time a lot more. The fort and the refinery are limited based off of the level land you have. So if you have a level two land, your fort can only go to level three. If you have a level three, um, two land, your refinery can only go to level three, and so on across the board. So you need to have a level five land to max a fort and max a refinery. So that's a really, really good question. So four increases your daily um, tribute, yep. And then your shards are based off your refinery level. So I have to upgrade a dark, a refinery on a castle in a dark land in order to increase the number of shards, I, dark shards I get from dark land. It only increases that single element, so. Hope that makes sense, but it's your fort and your refinery are um, limited. So, yep. Let's go back to tower. Okay. Tower reduces troop training time. Yay! And enfeebles your enemy. This is lovely, right? The member role is the scholar. The importance is secondary simply because this is a tower, this is a, an infrastructure piece you need by 
every means. Um, but you need your fort first to grant passage. You need a bank to do all that. But your fort will cap out right away. So what I recommend when you're building infrastructure is if your fort caps at level three, stop your banking HQ at level three. Keep them together until everything else is maxed. So four is really important to get to level three and bring your headquarters and your bank with you to level three as well. After you get your four to level three, then you go to your tower here because of its active ability to enfeeble enemy Primarch. So I'm going to read <laughs> anonymous. I'm going to read to you the bottom paragraph here, which is about enfeeble. The scholar, governor, leader, or officers can use the target ability of enfeeble enemy Primarch to temporarily reduce the level of towers on an enemy player's base by selecting the enemy player's Primarch. So let's use the example of a max base, so level 65 towers. Um, some of our towers, our really high level towers, can take that. Instead of fighting level 63 tower or level 65 towers, we fight like level 50 towers. <laughs> so enfeebling your enemy kind of does the same thing as the spell enfeeble. It takes the attack and defense power of their towers and reduces it greatly. It just simply reduces the level. Um, I'm going to continue reading. The debuff lasts 630 seconds, which is 10 and a half minutes, with a 60 second or 10 minute cooldown in between uses. With level one infrastructure tower, the debuff is negative 8% base tower levels. Each additional uh, tower level increases the effect of debuff by 3%. So uh, level one tower is 8% reduced, and then level two tower is 11% reduced. Level three tower is, you know, 14% uh, reduced. Does that make sense? Now, when you enfeeble, you have to enfeeble a specific primark. So if I go um, back to the game, I'm going to exit out of here. So if there was a Primark here, an enemy, I would be able to tap them and press Enfeeble Enemy Primark. So if this was an enemy, I'd be able to Enfeeble here, or I'd be able to Enfeeble, of course, through Castle Details. So it weakens their whole base. So that means if you have someone that is being a dick and is a higher level coming to attack your castle, you have your Scholar, Governor, Leader, or Officer go into the tower. Oop. Tower. And you say enfeeble and it'll tell you and let you select from all of the enemies that are there here so again it enfeebles them for 10 and a half minutes and then after that point you have 10 minutes until you can enfeeble another primarch so this is really good to hold your castle if you are a lower level team because it makes even high level bitches become lower level bitches it's great um the thing that you used to be able to do which is broken now is just create a portal which is why my sheet doesn't talk about this i'm not going to even talk about portals just because you don't need them anymore because we have flying Primarchs. Um, so Enfeeble is what the tower does and then reduce troop training time. You can appoint a Scholar. Again, the Scholar can only control the tower and the Enfeeble ability. You can level it up. You can see that the tower here at Rule of the Chill is currently leveling. I could expedite it if I had a bunch of clocks um, by paying the clocks here, but you can see I have not a lot of clocks. <laughs> I don't even have enough clocks to do 11 days. So. This is the tower, it's exciting. Um, so when you're leveling infrastructure, get your fort to max, which will be level three for um, level two lands, and then build your towers to protect yourselves. The last one here is the refinery. So let's talk about the refinery. So the member role is the foreman, which is passive. I say passive because there is no action that the foreman can do. So if you want to stroke someone's ego, make them the foreman of the refinery because they literally can't do anything. It just lets them have a fancy title and they can't fuck anything up. The refinery should be the very, 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 very last building that you level up if you're trying to hold your first castle because the only thing it does is increase crafty materials from poachers. But Red, we want crafty materials so bad. Don't care. <laughs> Increasing your crafty materials isn't going to help you hold your castle. And if you're a platinum team, you want to focus on holding your castle. Right? Right. All right. So this increases the number of crafty materials your team earns from poachers based off of the refineries you have in that level. The foreman has no active roles. So that is our stuff. I could appoint a foreman if I want. Well, the governor appoints a foreman. It's level one, you can see, because ice is not our focus. We were upgrading our other refineries first. So as a refresher course... You have your first castle. Woohoo! You're so excited. When you get your first castle, your infrastructure starts at level zero. You have no infrastructure there. So you'll be able to see all of it. So it's not like these buttons will be gone. You can see all of it, but they'll give you no bonuses. They'll be level zero. The first thing you're going to focus on is your fort. <laughs> your fort grants your team, your allies, and anyone who has passage to you a bonus, which makes it harder to kill your troops. 
It grants the blockade, which is the angry red circle, which tells people to stay away. It allows you to have that shield, meaning if people kill a certain number of your troops, a bubble pops and it protects you for up to 24 hours. Your fort allows you to grant passage, turning that red scary ring into a green ring for up to five other teams in the game, not counting your allies. And it's great. And this also increases your daily tribute, your gold, um, or your, or sorry, your egg tokens or your um, troop daily tribute in atlas the fort is number one the very 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 first thing that you upgrade is your fort you will need to pull your headquarters in your bank you'll have to level those up in order to get your fort to max once your fort is max which again is level three for tier two land once your fort is level three stop upgrading your hq and bank Red, we want the bonuses your bonuses don't do shit if you can't hold on to your <laughs> castle so level your fort up to max which will be level three for tier two and then you want to build your tower. But Red, why do I want to build my tower? Because tower makes high level bitches into lower level bitches. Your tower is really, really, really important. So let's say you are a low level team. You have a level 500 bitch that's coming to attack you. If you use your tower to enfeeble that Primarch, you might have a high level friend, hi Red, who's looking for glory. You grant me passage. You enfeeble that Primarch. I come, I kill him really, really easily. I get good glory. You get rid of a high level douche on your base. Pretty simple, right? Or if it's not even a level 500, it's level like 200 or 300. Enfeebling the towers makes it much, much easier for you to attack them, kill them, and get a better ratio. Again, in level three, we're gonna talk a lot about the different Primarchs that you can get. We're gonna talk about attacking. We're gonna talk about um, glory. We're gonna talk about all of those more nitty gritty stuff. But the episode two here, we're really focusing on um, leadership stuff, infrastructure, things like that. So these are refineries, build up your fort to max and then max your tower. Go back and go and upgrade your HQ and bank. Typically, I think Foresight recommends you just get them to the same level as your fort and stop and then do some refinery stuff. Um, but it really depends on what your team wants at that point. But the fort and tower are really, really, really important to hold on to shit, to hold on to your troops. So, and to hold on to your castle. <laughs> oh, V, you're so cute. Um, apparently the tutorial teaches you about portals. Well, if you really wanna know about portals, portals are basically in the tower, you could create a portal that would take you immediately to another castle that you own. But this was before Primarchs could just fly there now you don't really need portals because you just click a castle that you own and you can fly there it's pretty easy okay so that's infrastructure really basic again there are different levels of land Ooh, is there a primark can enfeeble let's enfeeble a primark let's go have fun okay ready for lesson time we're gonna go to manage we're gonna go to tower enfeeble enemy primark i'm gonna click friend family i'm gonna enfeeble him you've successfully enfeebled the enemy primark now, if I look here, he's gonna have a lovely chevron over his head. This means he has been enfeebled. I am going to take my seizure as my primary here. I'm gonna immediately transport to Real the Chill by using the castle menu. I am going to tap my castle once it loads. <sighs> yes, Angela can kill if Angela is already there and beats me. Oh, it'll take me too long to get there. So if Angela goes and kills it, this guy only has 15,000 troops. Um, so take two hits to kill him. You can see that my Seager is on his way. I can speed it up with Ruby, still be there in 13 seconds. Um, so that Primarch will now have lower level towers. So this is French family um, C3. All right, so let's look at what his base normally looks like. Team meeting hall, French fam. Oops, I can spell. Platinum team, sorry boo. C3. Let's look what his base normally looks like before an enfeeble. So he has level 45 towers on that small. Do you see that? Level 45 towers. Let's see what he has when he's enfeebled. Back to Atlas. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, now when he's enfeebled, I'm going to attack with my CJ, which is highlighted in gold. Attack. So remember, he had 45 towers before enfeeble. And now after enfeeble, he has level 34 towers. So he lost 11 tower levels on his max level so look at this now a 217 i'll have to kill us level 34 towers so i'm gonna go in i'm just gonna go with shezzy here so enfeeble will allow you to kill enemies that are a little bit harder for you but also give you a better chance to kill it easily if you can make something easier make it easier on yourself so we're going through here i'm attacking with my uh seizure 
I'm using Shizard. You can see there's a defender. If you haven't already seen what Atlas looks like when you attack because you haven't attacked an invader base or anything, it always has this really pretty look. Um, make sure you kill this lovely bridge over there. Also, it's a pain in the ass. Let's see how <laughs> if this guy actually tries. Obviously, we're just going through and single killing this. This is my expert Harbinger Shizard. <laughs> Mm -mm. So this is why Enfeeble is so great. So remember, 45 towers down to level 34 towers, guys. That's a huge difference for a lot of you. And it's really important that you give yourself the opportunity to have an easier time. So upgrade your fort so that way you'll lose less troops when you attack or are attacked at that castle. Um, and then also upgrade your towers so you can Enfeeble an enemy Primarch so they can't kill you as easily. And you can kill them easier, which is so great. Um, yeah. <laughs> Guys, this is kill the bridge. The bridge is really important to kill um, before the Long Island because it's annoying. But we'll talk about that in attacking tomorrow or the next day whenever we do episode three. <laughs> Alrighty. 100%. So we got five flames. Oh, did Angela beat me? No, I got some. So you can see I lost 755 troops and I destroyed 5,000. I got 1,000, 1.1 thousand um, glory for that. My conqueror, who is my Atlas sorcerer writer, who's on Shazard, got 1.13k glory. And that means my Seedra Primark got that much as well. So we can now take a look there. He's still alive, but I'm sure Angela's killing him. <laughs> uh, hi, Gaza. You were the first one. So if we look at this tower, you can see now I have a cooldown. So I still have 6.4 minutes before I can um, enfeeble another enemy Primarch. So I'm enfeebling up to 23% of its uh, the t base strength because this is a level 5 tower. And if we look here in our uh, ledger, which is so... Remember, I'm in my Atlas menu. For those of you that missed episode 1, I'm going to press ledger. I can look directly at my battles here. You can see that I attacked French family C3 DFR um, about one minute ago. I lost 755 troops. He lost 5,000. I gained 1.1k glory and he probably didn't get very much at all. You can see where I fought it. So this will take you directly to that castle, show you who is there right now. And then I can also look in ledger under team battles and see <laughs> who has attacked that person since Enfeebled. So we look back a minute ago, we can see Angela was the very first person. She used her Destroyer. Remember, Destroyer is one of those Primarchs you want to get, guys. She used her Destroyer, lost 1.1 thousand troops, killed 5,000 on his fighter. And then I attacked, lost 755k, or 755 troops, and they lost 5k. And then you can see that Pog attacked with his Destroyer as well and killed um, 5,000 troops. And then Lutris got his last attack in there with his Seizure and killed um, the remainder 555 troops that French Family C3 DFR had on his fighter. I know that those were the last ones because where it says wipe out, that means that Primark lost every single troop and was free and has to be re-summoned by that player to do anything else. So, that's that. <laughs> I got a defender too, Iggy. <laughs> hi puppies, hi Gaza. You can look at your troops if you want. Oh my gosh. Um, I'll show you guys those troops, but I only want to show you guys those troops. So I'm going to put you guys on the screen for a second. So I'm going into Ledger. I'm going into, just to show up for Gaza, Contributions. I am going to edit my um, thing here. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it this button? It's this one. Nope. I don't remember what button I'm supposed to use. Is it? I thought it was command. So I only show Gaza's. I forgot what button it was to shrink this with the or to crop it. There it goes. Okay. I'll show you guys those troops here. <laughs> All right. So if we go back to the game, I'll show this to you very, very carefully. So this is what looks like what this is what happens under ledger. So if we take a look here, you can see my assets, which is where I see my troops. Um, you can see my battles, which are just my attacks. Team battles is what you're just on. Contributions. So contributions here show you what your whole team has. So you'll be able to see the player, which is the heads there, their first, second, and third Primark that they have out, their monthly gold earned, their monthly um, shard, like elemental shards earned, how many troops they've killed, how many troops they've lost, um, and then their total troops. So if I click 
that total troops had you see it's now orange you'll be able to see the most troops that we have on our team down to the least and so if you see gaza who should mean to fucking show off he has um gathered 136 million gold so far this month 5k poacher stuff he has killed bunches of fucking troops and he currently has 406,000 troops you fucking show off angela you're getting close angela's at 222,000. we have a lot of troops <laughs> um my guys said he has nothing better to do when he's at work so we're going to talk about troops and primarchs and training and attacking and stuff tomorrow uh let's switch the screen so i can go back to the normal oops ah what did i do i clicked something oh my god what did i click shit oh shit that was terrifying there we go that was so scary. So, ah, damn it. There we go. <laughs> Alrighty, so that is a little bit on owning a castle. That is about infrastructure. That is about the bonuses it gives you, everything like that. So I hope you learned a little bit about infrastructure, owning a castle, the benefits. Remember, upgrade your fort first, tower second, and then max out everything else. Um, and yeah, that's infrastructure. So I hope you guys learned a little bit about owning castles. Uh, remember, don't assign someone to a role just because you like them. It's scary. There's a lot that can go wrong. They can waste a lot of your troops. Um, my advice to you is just let your officers and leaders do it. Banker is something that's really helpful to have, but I would encourage the rule of you cannot send to yourself to encourage no one to steal from the bank or be um, cruel like that. Chat six says, a little off topic. What summer season dragon do you think is best? Uh, I believe that the festive dragon coming up, Axie, will be the best um, dragon this summer if you are not in Vanguard. So if you are a Harbinger or below, get Axie. It's a hunter. He's got two white spells. He shits rainbows. I'm not even kidding. And he's great, actually. He's a really, really good dragon. So and because I said it put a big smile on my face. I only have 11 and hours left of work. Oh my God, Kaza. You're crazy. God's is absolutely crazy. Overachiever. Anonymous says, I want to be refinery person. I need more of a <laughs> Yep, the refinery does nothing. If you need reminders on what each thing does, head to Atlas Basic Beginners posters for line chats. Um, I give you some basic things here, such as the reminders of what piece of infrastructure does, um, the details for each piece of infrastructure, their max tower levels, infrastructure per territory, and what to level first. So four is first. Um, and then talks about bank and HQ that you'll need to bring them to the same level as your fort then tower, and then finally refinery. So that is about your infrastructure. That is about um, a little bit of leadership stuff going on about who to choose and owning a castle and owning a territory. We'll talk more about um, capturing and conquering territories tomorrow um, or the next day on episode three, which talks about um, Primark details. We talk about attacking. We talk about glory. We talk about more of the specifics of Atlas and how to do a lot of the functions to kind of kill bitches, right? But in the meantime, remember the following. If you are a platinum team, please go for level two land. Don't be greedy. Just like building a base, it is better to build one tower really high than three towers kind of mediocre. So the same thing goes with Atlas. So if you see these, this level two land here, which is held by our allies, Chaos Avenge, Booty Call, Sex Pod, and Sex Pistol. Um, so it would be better if you're a platinum team to get one castle and share that land with two other teams or maybe get two castles. Just like in game, it's better to have one level 60 tower than three level 20 towers. It's really important that you pick something, build it really strong. It's really easy to lose a castle if you don't build your infrastructure max, guys. So be very, very mindful about that. If you want a good guide on how much, how many castles you should take, if you have a million troops built up before land expansion, which comes at the end of the month, I would recommend 1 million troops per castle. So that is about 20,000 troops per member, which you guys have elite should be really easy, honestly. If you have more than a million troops, yeah, then why don't you consider taking two castles? If you have more than 3 million troops, try to take a whole territory by yourself. But it really depends on how active your team is and how much you're willing to put into that. So using your troop count is a really good indicator to see how active your team is going to be, how much gold they're using, how active they are in Atlas, to really give you a good indication of how many castles your team should take. The more active your team is, the more troops they have, the more castles you can hold, but still stick with level two land. No matter how active your team is, if you're in platinum, I'm sorry, I love you. 
you're not going to be able to hold higher than level two land as your very first ter first territory. Diamond teams. I'm a diamond team leader, guys. We're actually a pretty high influence diamond team leader in Atlas. Um, we still like level three lands, guys, and I'm in diamond. So if you are a platinum team, stick with level two. Don't push it. Find something that's safe that you can hold to really build a foundation and get those bonuses for your team. So, <laughs> um, it does shit rainbows. So if you're in Vanguard, what do you think? Um, if you're in Vanguard, all of these dragons suck this season. Um, so I'm going to get Axie just because it shits rainbows. <laughs> Um, Puppies is getting the festive dragon. The rainbow crapper, he's he's not weak at all. Um, so for those of you that don't know, I'm in the gameplay faction along with a couple other my teammates and I know obviously have friends in the gameplay faction because we've been playing for such a long time. Axie is really good. <laughs> um, I mean, he's not overpowered by any means. He's a lot of fun to fly. His spells are great. They're really well balanced. Again, if you're not in Vanguard, He's a great dragon. He's a hunter. Um, by far the best dragon this season. Without a doubt. Unless you're in Vanguard. Vanguard, you're just kind of fucked. Um, because the mythic hunter or the mythic warrior sucks. Um, but Axie is great. I highly recommend that everyone get him if you've saved up the sigils. Even if just as a collector dragon, he is so freaking funny. Like rainbows galore man he's so great so i beta tested that dragon um with some of my teammates he's so much fun to fly i by far the best dragon this season i really love him so yeah that was our little off off topic bit so this is atlas basics episode two hopefully you learned a, lit, a little bit about infrastructure about territories castles owning a castle and managing the leadership portions of a castle if you have any questions make sure you check out the um atlas guides on the forums you can access those in game remember so if i go back to main game here click settings forums we'll go here do, 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 do. All right, if we go here, if I scroll down, I'm gonna look for these this guides and resources section. If I click Atlas, we'll look at all these things here. So um, some of my things we have, Atlas, the beginner friendly guide, Atlas, the beginner friendly guide part two, Atlas, glory for riders and primarchs, and Atlas, beginner and basic posters for line chats. If you go into here in game, you'll be able to see all of my posters as well as a link to all of the things you may need for Atlas learning. You can take any of these posters you want and you can request any po uh, poster you want. Some of the most important ones I talked about yesterday that you might wanna send your team are at the bottom here. So, which is, how to manage your troops, uh, which is important for all of you players right now, and how to not piss off a team. <laughs> this is a really important thing, which talks about keeping off the castle, stay away from red rings, and get glory in no man's land. Zots does not shit rainbows. And Zots also does not reach Vanguard, so. Here with the rainbows are the important part. So this is all the information you may need. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to me in game and we will either do tomorrow or the next day for episode three of Atlas, which we'll talk about attacking glory, higher level primarchs and um, higher level strategical play for Atlas. I hope you guys learned something from this. I hope it gave you a really good foundation of what's going on in Atlas. I love you guys. You guys know that so, so much and it's been fun. And I'm gonna go do my invader runs and get some gold and build some troops because everyone loves some troops. So love you guys. See you on the next one. <laughs>